Good afternoon and welcome. I'm Susan Murray, Director of the David Hume Institute, an independent think tank established in 1985 to increase the diversity of thoughts on issues related to the economy and public policy in Scotland. A link to our website is in the Zoom chat if you'd like to find out more about our work. Now, just before we get started today, I'm going to tell you about a few things about how the event will run. There are live captions available for anyone that's like to see them. Just click the CC button for closed captions at the bottom of your screen. We're recording the session and it will be uploaded to our website afterwards. And as I welcome everyone, please do use the chat to introduce yourself and connect with others, for example, through sharing a link to your LinkedIn profile if you'd like to. The hashtag for today's event is Scotland's Populations. Now, please note the two S's in that. Um, it's to re recognise the diversity in Scotland's populations, and Mike is very specific about that. So Scotland's Populations, please share on social media. Um, there will be approximately 30 minutes of uh, presentation from our speakers today before we move into questions from the audience. Um, for the questions, please post them in the Q&A section and we'll invite you to unmute so you can ask your questions directly in your own words. And as we near the end of the event, we may group questions to try and get through as many as possible. Now, on to our topic for discussion today, Scotland's populations. It's a subject we've discussed before at the David Hume Institute, and it's a subject that is critical to so many decision makers in Scotland. It has big implications for the Scottish economy and so many related areas of public policy from labour market and migration to housing policy, education and healthcare provision. I'm delighted to welcome some old friends to the Institute, our speakers today, to discuss this important subject. Dr es Esther Rufsed is Head of Population and Migration Statistics at the National Records of Scotland. Esther is a statistician with more than 15 years experience in demographic statistics and before joining the NRS she worked as a statistician in the Scottish Government. Professor Michael Anderson is Professor Emeritus of Economic History and an Honorary Professorial Fellow, that's a, uh, not easy to say, um, and has more letters after his name than anyone I know so please excuse me for not listing them all now. Um, Mike is an expert on Scottish demography. In 2018, he published through Oxford University Press his book on Scotland's populations from 1850 to today, which explores population growth and decline, rural settlement, depopulation, migration and emigration. Mike has also served on many research programme and advise, policy advisory boards, including with ONS and the ESRC Centre for Population Change. So without further ado, um, I'm delighted to welcome Mike and Esther, over to you. Right, can everybody hear me? Can you hear me? Yes. Good. Right. Yes. Okay. Right. <clears throat> There's been in Scotland a widespread um, view in recent years uh, that a slowly growing population is important for our future economic, economic and social success. It's therefore not surprising that following the recent report from uh, NRS that projected that Scotland's population will soon stop growing and will begin to fall after 2028, there were quite wide concerns expressed, even though, given current and recent uncertainties, this is actually only called an interim report. Anyway, in today's talk, we'll try and show something of the background to these latest projections, noting particularly that the assumptions which underlie them were mainly set by expert advisory groups last September, We'll then consider how robust the conclusions and timings of any future downturn are likely to be, particularly in the light of more recent events. But first, a bit of context. If Scotland's population falls from 2028, it will not, as this graph shows, be the first time. The graph shows the populations of various northwestern European countries from uh, 1850 to 2011. And the left hand, the vertical axis, is on a log scale. So it shows relative, not absolute values. And as a result, the angle of the slope shows the steepness of change. What the graph shows above all 
is that of all these countries, Scotland, that's the solid dark blue line, has had the slowest growth, particularly since the 1890s. And the only period which was major exceptions was uh, Ireland up to the uh, 1960s, that's the green circles, and briefly in the 1920s and 1930s, Wales at the bottom, that's the green dots. But above all, what the Grush makes clear is that Scotland's population growth has always been much slower than England's, the red line at the top. And in fact, Scotland's population actually fell in the 1920s and fell again between about 1970 and 2000. And it was the only country in Western Europe where the population actually fell in that period. So actually, it was a bit of a surprise when our population began to uh, grow in the early 20th century. And as Esther's slide, next slide shows, it went on growing. Um, yeah, so as Mike says, um, the population has been growing since the start of the 21st century. Um, in this slide, I've cut off the vertical axis so it doesn't start at zero. So we've sort of zoomed in to see a lot more of the specific detail. So the population's been growing. And then this latest set of projections, which we published earlier this year, showed the population continuing to grow just very slightly and then starting to fall. Um, and this is new. So this was this is the same line again, but showing the previous sets of projections to give a bit of context. So all of the previous projections were higher, and this is the first set for some time that have shown the population of Scotland falling over the next 25 years. So the last set of projections showed the population growing slowly and then starting to level off, whereas this set showed it leveling off and then starting to fall, and we'll explain why in a few moments. So um, it's important, I turned over too many pages, um, so why is population change important? So population change matters for a number, quite a wide range of reasons. If you're planning almost any sort of service, the size of the population and the relative age structure of the population is one of the most important things to take into account. So whether that's something like health and social care, schools and nurseries, um, whether you're planning housing, also for understanding the size and the makeup of the workforce, the population is really important. There are a lot of really important financial implications to population change. So the tax revenues that are available to fund services, um, for pensions and for the funding allocations as well. The size and the age makeup of the population is really important. Then all of us have an impact on the natural environment. So um, the more of us there are, the more impact there is. And also these statistics are incorporated into most other government statistics. So um, whether you're looking at figures from say crime to COVID, they will include the population as a denominator so that you can make comparisons across different areas. Um, this is a specific example of why population change is so important. So over the next 25 years, we're projecting that the overall population will fall just very slightly, um, but there are very big differences by different age groups. So birth rates have been falling for quite some time. So we're projecting the number of children to fall by around a fifth over the next 25 years, which is quite a substantial change. And this has been going on for some time. So we're also seeing decreases in the number of young adults. Not so much change in these age groups, but the biggest increase by far is in the oldest age groups. And actually the older the age group, the bigger um, the growth is. And that's really important to understand. If you're planning services like um, schools, nurseries, health, social care, then it's really important to understand not just meeting the needs of the current population, but as how the population is going to change as we um, move into the move into the future and meeting needs of future populations. Um, and also we have a lot of confidence in these figures. So um, a couple of percentage points different in the overall population projection should, could tip the population um, slightly into whether it sort of um, grows or falls. But we have a lot of confidence in the aging population. It's something we've seen for a long time and um, it's happening in many other countries as well. And a few percentage points difference here wouldn't make any real difference to the fact that the population is aging substantially. 
Um, also, there are big differences in different parts of the country. Now, normally we follow our projections with a set of figures at council level. We haven't done that this time because they're interim projections. But so I've taken the map from the last set of projections that we produced, which shows the overall patterns in different parts of the country. So this shows pop projected change in population over the next decade. The darker green areas are where the population is projected to grow the fastest. So it's largely the central belt and especially towards the east of the country. The paler green areas, the population is projected to grow, but more slowly. And the grey areas, the palest areas, are where the population is projected to fall. And that's about a third of council areas in Scotland, um, largely in the west of the country, also some of the island groups. And this is really important to understand because um, a single figure for Scotland <laughs> includes a huge amount of variation within the country. Meeting the needs of a growing population is a challenge. Meeting the needs of a falling population is also a challenge and a very different kind of challenge. So you need to know what is happening in different areas um, to understand how to uh, meet people's needs. Um, and to make things even more complicated, there are also variation within every council area. So we produce not projections, but we produce estimates of the population every year for each neighbourhood in Scotland. Um, and we publish all of this and we now produce interactive maps which let you see what it looks like in your particular area. So I've taken Orkney as an illustration. So every council in Scotland has some neighbourhoods where the population is growing and some where it's falling, but to quite different extents in different parts of the country. Um, looking at Orkney here, we can see, so the green areas are where the population has been growing over the last decade. And that's largely the areas sort of around Kirkwall. Um, the orange areas are where the population has been falling, so that's the areas more further away from Kirkwall and in particular the, um, the Northern Isles there. So it lets, it's a nice sort of illustration of how even within a, a council area um, there's a lot of variation in what's going on. Now this chart um, compares the projections for Scotland, which is the top bar, the minus 1.5%, with the rest of the UK. And in fact, the projections for the UK as a whole, that's the second bar from the bottom, do show that the population for the UK is still expected to grow right through to 2045. But this is in fact at a slightly slower rate than in the last projections. Lying behind this graph, however, there are considerable similarities across all countries. Every part of the UK is expected to see a decline in the number of children. Every part of the UK is expected to see the working age population not changing very much. And every part of the UK is expected to show um, the number of older people growing. But as the graph shows, Scotland is the only part of the UK where the population is actually projected to fall over the next 25 years. No, no, but we shouldn't get over alarmed by that fall. It is only one and a half percent. Now, there is, of course, a view, uh, and somebody may want to pick this up later, that a slowly falling population may not be a bad thing. But there might nevertheless be particular concerns, I think, if, as shown here, um, the rest of the UK is growing and Scotland is falling. Among other things, if Scotland is in the UK, that would affect UK central government um, financial allocations to Scotland. And actually, the one that concerns me most is that a falling national population would make it even harder to deal with the problem of our worst declining regions and areas, the ones that uh, Esther uh, spoke about a few minutes ago. So projections are important, but what are they? So projections aren't predictions of what government expects to happen. They're largely based on projecting past trends. So what would happen if past trends continued into the future? And this means that they become less accurate the further into the future that you go. Um, there's always uncertainty around projections and more so at the moment. So there's a lot that's changing in the population um, between COVID and Brexit are having big impacts on the population and we don't fully know what impact that will have longer term. Um, also a lot of the data sources are being affected by um, by COVID in particular. So there's more uncertainty in the, in the data that we're using. Normally, um, and whenever we publish um, 
these statistics or talk about them, we always emphasize this uncertainty around the figures. Um, normally we follow up the project, well we include variant projections at the same time, so we might look at how, what the population would be like if migration was higher or lower uh, than the main projection is showing. And we normally follow them up with council level projections. This set of projections is classed as interim projections and we're not having in variant projections or council level projections as part of them. But we'll be publishing a new set next year which will be a full set of projections and that will include variant projections and be followed by council level figures. Right, well now um, let's look at this in a bit more detail. Um, look at the components which underlie population change and which underlie uh, these projections. In this graph, uh, let's look first at natural change, that's the difference between births and deaths, that's plotted here as the grey dashed line. Now back in the 1960s, birth rates were high and births well outnumbered deaths, so natural change was very positive as the uh, graph shows. I mean in the 1960s it was anything up to about 40,000 uh, uh, per year. But in the 1960s and the early 1970s, birth rates fell really quite fast. And because death rates only improved slowly, from the mid-1970s, natural change fell to about zero. And indeed, uh, in many years since the late 1990s, there have actually been uh, more deaths than births each year. <laughs> Meanwhile, if we look at the green line, net migration, this has shown a very different pattern. Uh, net migration, when we talk about it here, by the way, includes both migration from the rest of the UK um, as well as from overseas. <clears throat> now, almost throughout the 19th and 20th centuries, more people left Scotland than moved here each year. And that continued until uh, around 1990. So net migration was almost always negative. The result was that as natural change fell to around zero in the 1970s and net migration stayed negative, Scotland's population began a period of decline, as I showed on the um, first graph. By contrast, since the start of the 21st century, more people have moved to Scotland each year than have left. And that has been enough to offset even the most recent decline in, um, uh, in natural change, which is mainly due to a significant further fall in the number of births, as we'll show in a minute. The result taken together is that the present assumption is that net migration at the moment is just about two and a half thousand larger than the difference between deaths and births. This is what leads us to believe that population is still rising slowly. But I put that quite deliberately because there is a lot of uncertainty about just what is happening even at the moment, but let's assume that that is correct. But what happens, what is to happen, do we think in the future or rather does the, do the projections think in the future? Uh, now this graph, um, shows past net migration figures since 2005, up to the dotted vertical line, uh, which is uh, 2020. And it also shows projected figures for the next 25 years. Um, net overseas emigration, uh, migration, sorry, is, called, is the green line. Net migration between Scotland and the rest of the UK in this graph is the black line. Now, the most recent projections show, in fact, little change compared with past projections, and that, I think, is interesting. Um, but the past projections, the immediate past ones, did show a marked reduction um, in net migration, particularly in international migration, compared with the average inflows over the previous uh, 15 years. And the most recent projection, as shown here, is for a roughly straight line average of about uh, plus 19,000 migrants a year. But notice on the left-hand side of this graph just how much annual variation 
than has been in the past. Migration is the most difficult component to predict. And really, uh, at any one time, it's only uh, uh, a best guess about the medium term. And certainly since 2020, there have been a lot of changes. The combined effects of Brexit, declining relative income levels between Scotland and where the immigrants have come from, and now COVID and its lockdowns. These have all meant that many EU migrants appear to have left the UK. We still don't know exactly how many, nor how many new uh, EU migrants will want to come and indeed be allowed to come in the future. But offsetting that um, fall in EU migration, and this was not really predicted, we now know there's been a quite big rise in non-EU immigration, non-EU immigration to the UK since 2019. And actually overall, this is believed to have more or less offset the loss in EU migration, at least at UK level. Though, of course, the migrants from the non-EU migrants are probably a different skill mix of people. And, not, don't and we don't necessarily know how many of them exactly will be coming to Scotland. And certainly, uh, they may not be the right people to meet some of our biggest labour challenges. Another issue of uncertainty about the future is what will happen to overseas students. They've been a very important migrant group to Scotland in recent years. Now, superficially, student migration shouldn't have much medium term positive or negative effects, because surely students come to do a course and then leave. But actually, quite large numbers of EU students in particular stayed on after graduation and they pushed up the population. And being young adults, if they stayed, that was particularly useful for uh, improving the balance of the population, because if they stayed and have children, that would actually uh, be a very positive uh, factor. Certainly, EU applications have fallen very markedly um, to universities. So that component is certainly down. The rest of the world applications have remained very strong, but certainly, don't offset the EU ones. Now, of course, on the positive side, at least from the point of the population figures, Ukrainian refugees will provide a bit of an unexpected bonus uh, to immigration, but who knows how big and for how long that will go on. One obviously hopes that it will stop. The other question, which is always very difficult to predict, is migration from England to Scotland. In the early 21st century, there was quite a move of um, English professionals out of London in particular uh, and back to Scotland. They'd gone for a while and then they came back. And there are hints at least um, that um, migrants to London are again having second thoughts but to what extent that's just a COVID effect, we're not sure. So I suppose the conclusion from this component is there's an awful lot of uncertainty in that figure. But I think what we've learned since last September when the original um, estimates underlying the projections were produced is that maybe the projections on migration might be a bit too optimistic certainly, I suspect, not too generous. And it's even possible that the turndown might come a little bit earlier than predicted. So moving on now to look at births and deaths. This shows the numbers of each since 2005 and then the projected figures. So for numbers of deaths, which is this black line, you can see that the figures have been increasing and you can see the effect of the pandemic on the 2020 figures. Um, the reason for the medium term increase in number of deaths is because of the growing older population. So as we have more older people and as the baby boomers um, get older, as the old, older population grows over time, then each year the number of deaths eventually goes up as well. 
birth rates have been um, falling for some time and um, we and so we're now because of these two things we're now predicting that the gap between the number of births and the number of deaths is going to get wider um, each year during the period that we're looking at in the projections. So let's drill down a bit now and look at trends in life expectancy. This chart shows life expectancy at birth for males at the bottom, because it, it's always lower, females at the top, uh, for the four countries of the UK. And note that Scotland, the green line, is and has for a long time uh, been the worst of the four. The important point, however, to note here is that in recent years, up to um, the early years of the 2010s, life expectancy had steadily increased almost every year, everywhere. But a few years ago, that stopped. And indeed, in one or two years, it even dipped just a little bit. The dip on the right-hand side, by the way, is um, the impact, believed impact of the COVID pandemic. But the real issue for projections is, did what we have seen in the last 10 or so years suggest that long-term improvement in um, life expectancy had stopped and was perhaps going to continue to stop? And if so, why? And there were several competing theories. I mean, one uh, was uh, that um, poverty and austerity and an inability to see a satisfying future was uh, underlying a, uh, a, a rise uh, in mortality, particularly in some age groups. Another view was that the absence of major new diagnostic tools uh, in, in the last 10 years, that these diagnostic tools uh, like mass screening, and new treatments like statins and tamoxifen, for example, had been important in increasing uh, uh, life expectancy. And as the next graph shows, um, this is the predicted, uh, projected future life expectancy figures. Now, looking at this across quite a big area, including um, the, um, the, the experts, as um, stated in the um, background papers to the projections, it's clear there have been uh, considerable different views among experts as to what is li likely to happen, particularly in the next few years. But the latest projections, like the previous set, do assume a return to an improvement in survival, though at a slightly slower rate uh, than uh, the past projections. But if we look at changes since last September when the assumptions were set, if we look at the two uh, explanations, do we really expect that life expects that, sorry, that living standards will improve very much in the next few years? Or will they in fact tend to, if anything, to get worse? And particularly among the poorer members of our society who have the lowest life expectancy. And also, what about the mortality consequences of the even larger backlog of diagnosis and treatments which we now have? So there must be, uh, if we take the austerity um, uh, and health service view, um, I think some questions as to just how um, uh, big that rise will be, particularly perhaps uh, in the next four or five years. Also, recently, um, for COVID. Now, the new projections do assume some increase in COVID-related mortality over the next few years among the 30 and over age group. But I think recently, my reading is that there's been a bit more cautious view about epidemiologists about the future um, of um, COVID and its possible impact. Now, some doubts as to whether or not we can be so sure that uh, new vaccines and new current treatments will always trap every future variant. 
And so far, there are some exciting new diagnostic tools and treatments on the horizon, but how soon will they come on board? So I think certainly it's hard, in my view, to see the latest projections as um, too um, pessimistic, uh, too optimistic. And it may even be that they should be a bit more pessimistic. Um, looking now at fertility rates, so this is basically the number of children that people have. You can see that there's been a downward trend in fertility in all parts of the UK since the 1970s. It was reversed for a while um, from 2001 onwards, and then since the economic downturn of 2007 to 8, it's been going down again since then. And you can also see quite clearly from this chart that in Scotland, fertility rates have been lower than other parts of the UK, and that's been the case for a number of decades now. Um, this chart looks at the fertility rates um, in more recent years, and then the dotted line is the, what's included in the projections. So we know that fertility rates are affected by uncertainty and fear in people's lives. Um, we saw they, how they fell following the financial crisis. We also saw a fall um, following the start of the pandemic. And the main reason that this set of projections is lower than the last set of projections is because they're taking account of lower fertility rates. And that's true in Scotland, but also in all other parts of the UK, I think the fertility assumptions were lower in this set of projections compared to the last set. Um, the projections assume that fertility rates will level off um, over time and we'll have to see if that's what happens. So then, in sum, uh... It is projected that the population will fall over the next 25 years with a possible turnaround in uh, turn, turn down about 2028. But clearly, there are a lot of uncertainties, particularly about timing. There are two things, uh, however, that are certain. One is that population uh, is growing in some parts of the country and it's falling in others. Both those will be hard to change whatever happens, but my personal view, as those who've heard me talk about this before to the David Hume Institute will know that it's actually the problems of um, the differences between different parts of the country that should be worrying us much more than what's actually happening uh, to population uh, change at a national level. It's also clear though, that population will continue to age. Uh, there will be a growth in numbers uh, over the age of the um, uh, 60s, and there will be falls in numbers under the age of 30. There are, if we look at the projections, whatever happens, improvements in the death rate are likely to be small, and um, at least for the next few years. And that would not have to be much smaller to turn the population down earlier. There also seems to be rather little prospect that the birth rate will markedly increase. Net in migration has, as it says at the bottom, the bullet point, steadily pushed up our population in the past 20 years, but will it continue to do so? None of this suggests to me that a turn down in Scotland's population uh, is not going to happen. Um, and it may come even sooner and it could, and this is of course my entirely personal view, it could come much sooner and be larger. And that would simply take us back to where we were before 2000. So if you want to know more, we publish our population projections. The figures and the analysis are all included on the NRS website. And if you're interested in seeing the Scottish Government's response to population change, on the Scottish Government website, there's a document called a Scotland for the Future, Opportunities and Challenges of Scotland's Changing Population. And that's well worth a read as well. And now we're happy to hand over to you and to answer any questions that you've got. Fantastic. Thanks, Esther and Mike. Um, there is so much in that, I don't know where to start, but I'm going to start with birth, I think, and then work through to death, um, just before we come to questions. Um, 
I'm really interested in the assumptions in the data and you touched several times there on, on things that had been um, behind the scenes in the minds of the people that were making the projections. And I think understanding that for the audience, I think is really critical. Um, just um, as a bit of background, why is the birth rate in Scotland so much lower than the other bits of the UK? Um, we don't fully know. It's really interesting and it's been happening since, well, it wasn't the case um, prior to the 1980s and then during the 80s, um, it sort of fell lower and has stayed consistently lower since then. Um, the Scottish government's recently commissioned some research to try to get more of an understanding of what people's plans are and what are the barriers in terms of um, starting and or expanding their families. Yes, it is, a, it is a really big puzzle. It's perhaps the biggest single, uh, so far unanswered question. And there's a lot of interesting research going on, particularly at the University of Southampton at the moment, which we hope will throw some more light on this. Um, in the, um, up until the 1960s um, and 70s, Scots got married much less but they actually then had much bigger families when they got married. And we sort of moved into a, a situation that started to look more like the rest of the UK. And then, as Esther said, in the last 40 years, um, which has actually uh, fallen below. Um, it may be to do with um, a, a greater sense of, of, of insecurity and uncertainty. That's what I uh, tried to explore uh, in my 2018 book. But the short answer is, I think we really don't know and we'd love to know more. It definitely looks on the graph when you look at the steep decline over recent years that it's it's got sharper since Brexit and, and the Brexit vote almost. So the, the relationship with um, migration, I think is critical there. And um, we have a question on, um, working age population and adults. And now I know, Esther, that you prepared an extra slide of the graph and the tax take. And I just wonder, uh, Helen, do you want to unmute and ask your question? And Esther can also share the slide that she's got as an extra um, teaser, because I think that might might help. Um, Helen Chambers. Which, um, it's the one where you've got tax take. Uh, right, okay, yeah. Because I think that's useful for uh, yeah. looking at different ages of people. Helen, are you? Yep, brilliant. Yeah, yeah, I was just wondering, you know, obviously from social policy terms, we've always had the pressure of the baby bulge moving through the demographic, sorry, moving through the demographic picture. And I was wondering now whether we're getting a, ch a change in the ratio between the working age population and the non-working age population. Uh, yes, so I'll show you. I've got two slides actually, um, which I'll just share my screen. So this is the um, what the projections show in terms of the. So you've got the number of children, working age population, and pensionable age in all parts of UK. Scotland's highlighted in purple there. So yeah, as the number of children um, in all parts of the UK, actually, this has got more extreme in the later set of projections, the number of children is projected to fall, working age population not changing that much, and the pensionable age population is growing um, the most, so it does affect the proportion of working age to pensionable age populations. And this is the chart that Susan mentioned, which gives one of the reasons why this matters. So this is from Office for Budget Responsibility, and it shows as an average for each age group, what government spends on people by age and also the tax revenues. So tax revenues is this green line here, so that's far highest in the sort of working age population. Um, whereas spending is sort of higher for school age falls and then rises um, with age. So if you've got relatively fewer people in this age group who are contributing the most in tax and relatively more in the older age groups um, where government spends the most then it has um, an impact not just on the obvious things like health and social care but on everything that's funded by um, taxpayers money and I guess a fall in the number of children in the short term sort of has some savings in a way but then they get older and has a 
that will then have an impact on the working age population as well. Thanks, Esther. Oh, Mike. Yeah, can I just come back to, uh, with the, pre the previous question that you asked, Susan, about, um, about uh, differences in fertility? Um, one of the things that happens if you look at the um, uh, data actually both in Scotland and uh, uh, in, in England um, is that um, immigrant populations tend to have larger families. We, of course, have many fewer immigrants. And so one component could very well be tied up with that, but that's one of the things that research uh, is, is uh, I think, currently exploring, but it is, I think, a quite important uh, potential component. Mm -hmm. There is a question related to that from an anonymous attendee, so I'll ask it for them, um, to ask about fertility rates um, connected to fear and uncertainty. Now, I know we've discussed this before, Mike. Um, so is there research that directly relates to this economic um, worries and uncertainties affecting birth rates? So I'll, I'll tee you up there to say what you've said before to us. Right. Um, yes, I think we can be pretty sure about that using uh, historical data, certainly, um, the, there is, it's absolutely clear, for example, that if you looked in the 1930s, uh, depression, uncertainty, and then the fear of war had a significant impact um, on uh, pulling down um, the, the birth rate at that time. The boom years uh, of the uh, post-Second World War period coincided with, with um, uh, clearly a growing sense of security and indeed the introduction of um, welfare measures, which were quite important in providing people with the greatest degree of security. And it was really the, um, the, the, the turn down was partly linked to um, much of that welfare state provision uh, no longer being supported and developed in the same sort of way. And I think the, the nicest example is, of course, what happened uh, after 2008. Uh, in, uh, 2008. Up to 2008, the, the early years of the 21st century um, saw quite a significant rise right the way across the UK. Two th after 2008, um, particularly in Scotland, uh, fertility fell. It actually didn't fall in England for another couple of years, but after it, it fell really quite, uh, quite, quite rapidly. And um, I think that is fairly plausibly uh, attributed to, uh, to, to, to to growing uncertainty. I hope that's helpful. Yeah, um, we've got. Uh, I think. Hello, Cairns. You've got a couple of questions in there. Do you want to ask them both together? Are you able to unmute? Hi, can you hear me? We can hear you. Thanks, Flo. Yeah, yeah so um, I don't know which one it was that you wanted me to ask because that's... Ask, ask both of them, please. Uh, well, so I'm interested in uh, wealth. Um, if we had a wealth tax, your green line that showed the tax take, I wondered if you had any idea what the change to that would be. Um, and the other one was <clears throat> around um, population, uh, whether life expectancy, I think you may have already answered that actually, but life expectancy reduction, whether that was expected to have a substantial uh, impact. Thanks. So I can take the controversial one on wealth if you want, because um, I know that's... Oh, yes, important. please. <laughs> okay. Um, so, Flo, I'll direct you to some work by um, a brilliant past speaker of the David Hume Institute called Aaron Ardvani, who's working on um, wealth um, for the uh, CAGE Institute at the University of Warwick in conjunction with the LSE. And he is absolutely immersed in this at the moment. Um, it's a very different picture um, because the one of the tensions we're seeing in intergenerational wealth at the moment is um, how that would look different if there was a different type of taxation. So um, that's probably the best place to look. If you want to email me, I can send you the links. Um, and the second question, I'll hand over to Esther and Mike. Yeah, so yeah, life expectancy does affect the population. And the reason that in 
these projections, Scotland's population um, is lower than other parts of the UK is because we have lower birth rates in Scotland and we have lower life expectancy than any other part of the UK. It's not actually in the latest set of projections so much about migration um, as a percentage of the population. It was fairly similar or even a bit higher than some other parts of the UK. It was much more about births and deaths. Fantastic. Um, we've got another one there on um, the current generation of childbearing age adults are the first to be all but unable to own property. So more intergenerational um, questions there. And how could economic policy be used to support birth rates? Um, that's a, a really tricky question for two demographers to answer. Um, <laughs> there, there is a lot of discussion um, going on in terms of how different policy levers can be used. So a bit connected to one of Flo's questions, but um, some of the other policies being used in relation to um, uh, increasing childcare hours, the welcoming of babies into Scotland through policies like the baby box. Now, if you look at the, the cost benefit, that's probably gonna be a long-term policy, but has proven to be pay, paying off in some Scandinavian countries. And I think the for anyone that's noticed the used baby boxes being sent out to help refugees from the Ukraine. Um, a lot of the ones I saw being packed up in our in our local collection point were being written hand messages uh, with love from Scotland and things. So a massive advert there for, for something that has helped one person already going on to help another person. So it, there's interesting dynamics going on in ways that we probably can't predict at the moment on a policy that might not be realized to be connected to the labor market. I can see Mike nod nodding, so I'll let Mike go. Yeah, but I think if we look also at the, the housing question, mm -hmm. um, there is a lot of um, research going on into what is essentially waiting, to some extent, what has been happening to fertility over the last really 30 years is that people have been waiting longer to have their babies. And one of the things that it is very clear that many people waited for was to get themselves a decent house, or at least some decent kind of housing. And for a lot of people, that meant actually buying one. Um, and that was therefore a, a significant factor uh, in delay. The fact that uh, couples are having to delay longer and longer and longer uh, is seen by many people as a factor which is also tending to suppress um, fertility. And if we go back to the post-Second World War period, one of the factors that may very well have been particularly important in encouraging a boom in births in Scotland was the huge move to create um, uh, council housing estates where people could move and where of course there was a particular incentive to have a baby because it moved you up the council uh, the council waiting list and there is i think quite a lot of um, of, of, of feeling among demographers that housing constraints over or easier to get is one of the factors that almost certainly uh, affects timing and timing is important for two reasons. It's important um, because the more that people delay, the lower um, the birth rate looks, although it may catch up eventually. But also, the longer that women delay, the lower is their fecundity sufficiently to actually have some effect on the number of children that they're eventually able to have. And there's a very nice graph there just being produced for us by... Yeah. Yeah, so this just of um, shows a bit of evidence behind this. So the green line is the this is adults, um, young adults and tenure, and this the green line is numbers renting privately, which has tripled just since the start of the twenty first century. And then the dotted line is um, the numbers owning their own home, which has fallen by a corresponding amount. Thanks. I think the the thing that's really jumping out at me through this is how how much guesswork you know an estimated guess that are having to happen behind the scenes in order to interpret and and predict what's going forward and i really appreciated esther when you said we've got certainty in this number 
and less certainty in this number when you were presenting earlier because yeah. it really gives us a clue as to you know in terms of housing Mike how on earth do you plan for for housing when you're not quite sure particularly how many migrants we, we're going to have in Scotland um there's a few questions coming through but someone who hasn't asked a question this time um but uh usually does and I'm going to tee her up because I think it's an important part related to one of your graphs, which is um, Tilly from the food train. So Tilly, I'm going to come to you in a minute. Um, one of the things I've heard Danny Dorling talk before is about the relationship between austerity, loneliness, and the reduction or plateauing of the death rate. And I think as we're heading into more, um, you know, financially, um, tricky times with the massive cost of living rise. You touched on it earlier, Mike. Um, and I know um, Tilly's likely to ask a question related to this. So I'm just gonna tee you up, Tilly. Are you there and able to unmute? Because I think the kind of work that the food train's dealing with loneliness, um, I, am I right in saying that you're seeing an epidemic of this, Tilly? Yes, uh, we are. I was actually typing a question out, so that was <laughs> weird that you uh, said right at the same time. Um, yeah, I suppose what my question, was that we know one in 10 older adults are malnourished in Scotland. And that figure is actually probably an under um, representation. Um, our data suggests it could be up to 30% of those in receipt of social care. So loneliness is a risk factor of malnutrition. So with an aging population, um, we're obviously gonna be facing an epidemic of so many issues, including malnutrition, including loneliness. Um, so how can we better prepare or how can we use this information to um, prepare our social care system and build this infrastructure? Um, I don't know if you can even answer that question, but any thoughts would be really interesting. Thank you. And I'll, I'll just add to that um, before I hand over to Esther and Mike, which is one of the things um, we've been thinking about through the fiscal framework is the difference in cost of delivering services. And when you look at the changes in population, you know, a, a sort of gravitating towards the east of Scotland, that makes it much, you know, the, the, the more geographic dispersed population on the west in the rural areas, it, it will be harder to reach people that are struggling to feed themselves, potentially. Um, any any thoughts on what the data is telling us about that? Is, is that a a prediction we should be worrying about, Esther and Mike? So the population is certainly ageing um, and also we see more older people, older people are more likely to live alone um, and as the numbers of older people increase that has an impact. So if you imagine uh, if you've got a family and the children eventually leave home and there's two of you and then one of you dies and so the other person's left living alone and women are more likely to outlive their partners because women live longer and also tend to uh, marry men who are older than themselves. Um, another thing that we see is older populations in the more remote areas. So that ties in with what you were saying, Susan, about sort of supporting people. Um, and it, it's, it's, it's not my job to talk about how to meet the needs, but it's very much my job to talk about what the future population will look like so that people are aware that it's not just about meeting the needs of the current population it's that things are changing and if you're just basing everything on what things are like now it's not necessarily um, going to be enough and we need to look at what's what's going to happen in the future and yeah as we say the aging population is is, is a certainty um, you know the exact change in the overall population we might not know but we do definitely know that it's aging and if I can just say <clears throat> the point that um... Esther just made, and indeed Tilly just made, about rural areas. We want to look at to what, how many of the rural, extreme rural areas of Scotland have very elderly population. Follow up the link that takes you to Esther's maps uh, of um, neighbourhoods. And some of the uh, some of the extreme rural areas, particularly in uh, in, in the Outer Isles, uh, have very 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 high uh, proportion of their population elderly in really quite remote and difficult to get at areas. Thanks, Mike. I think it brings us on to a question from Kenneth Watt. So, Kenneth, if you're able to unmute and ask your question directly. So, we're jumping now from. Um, rural to a question more about urban. Hi, yeah, thanks very much and thanks for the presentation so far. I work for the British Red Cross. Um, 
and clearly this data is really relevant to how we're planning our services and one of the biggest things that um, affects how we work in Scotland is the the difference in need between urban and rural populations so it's quite interesting to start when I saw the graph comparing population growth in Scotland versus England and I just wondered how much of the um, relative increase in England is driven by large cities particularly London and inward migration there um, and if we've got an insight into population growth particularly in Glasgow but other cities in Scotland versus um, rural uh, population in Scotland as well. Um, yeah, the... oh, God. <laughs> oh, I'll just bring up the slide that I showed earlier um, showing population change um, at council level. So <laughs> Yeah, I mean, the, the cities, especially the bigger cities of Edinburgh and Glasgow, are largely growing. And then what we see is the areas around them growing as people, young people move into cities for work and for study. And then um, at some point they move out generally to find somewhere a bit more affordable and maybe thinking about starting a family and that sort of thing. So you see the areas around the cities growing as well. In terms of where the population is falling, we do see this in the more remote and the island groups and especially within there it tends to be the more remote parts of them so like firstly the more accessible islands in terms of the mainland tend to have populations growing more than the ones that are further away but you also see you know around Stornoway the population's been growing but most of the rest of Lewis um, the population's been falling but it's not just rural areas so in some of the sort of more urban parts of the west coastal areas like Inverclyde and Ayrshire and Western Bartonshire, we're seeing the population falling. And there it's for a different reason. So it's the neighbourhoods with the most deprivation where the population is falling the fastest, whereas in rural areas, it's more about accessibility rather than deprivation, which is the bigger issue in terms of um, population growth versus decline. Yes, I think that's absolutely right. I mean, I have to say that there is a lot of discussion in Scotland always about the problems of the declining rural areas. And actually, the Inverclydes, the Ayrshires, um, the West Dumbartonshires are a huge problem in terms of declining populations. And they actually, as local authorities, have um, higher rates of decline uh, than, in fact, most of the rural areas. And there are real problems there and real problems which go back to the fact that these are old heavy industry industrial areas, often with a great deal of ill health built in among the older people who work in uh, mining and um, uh, other debilitate, potentially debilitating, a lot of asbestosis. Um, in, in these sorts of areas. And I think that it's, it, 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 it is crucially important that we do not forget these areas and that if we're going to have um, policies to deal with um, uh, population decline, those are areas that must not be ignored. Thanks, Mike. Um, there is a question in the chat. Sorry, I was just while you were speaking then reading the chat rather than the Q&A because um, there are some questions that have gone in there. Um, Jennifer Bogue, you've got one on, you've got two in there. Um, we won't take the second home ones um, just now, but the, the, you've asked a question about the census. I wonder if you want to unmute and um, ask the question on the census. Yes, I'll certainly ask my question. Um, I'm concerned about the information I've been reading recently about the state of census and how we don't seem to have managed to get a very good response rate. And I'm concerned that that might have an effect in the future on the base population. Um, you know, we always we always update the base population um, with the census and we use it as a kind of um, quality assurance for the mid-year estimates. The mid-year estimates are now sort of 12 years out from the previous census. And if this census is not going to be very good, how can we be sure, um, you know, that the, the base for future projections is going to be accurate? So we've got 
Pete Whitehouse on the call, who's Director of Statistics at National Records of Scotland, and he's going to answer any questions on the census. So, Pete, are you there and do you want to... I, I can that? intervene and ask my colleague Tom, are you able to promote Pete to being a panellist so we can see him while he speaks, because that would be amazing. <laughs> or, Pete, do you want to just start speaking while we fiddle with the tech behind the scenes? Hi. Hi, Pete. Thanks for joining us. No, thank you very much. Um, so hello to everybody. It's fascinating uh, uh, sort of debate going on. So um, I'm Director of Statistical Services at uh, National Records of Scotland. So that's why Esther invited me to, uh, to join. Um, we're working on the census. It is, is a work in progress. We're very confident that we will deliver very high quality census outputs and very and associated with that very high quality population estimates. What I would say is that the quality of population estimates depends on a number of factors and the quality of census outputs depend on a number of factors. One, of course, is a very strong census response and a very good response across all areas of Scotland. And that is what we are very much focused on at this moment in time. But it also, because as, as many will know on the call, there are other things that we do. So we have a lot of administrative data, whether that's health data, education data, registration data, that helps us understand where we might have missed returns and how we can use that data to help our estimation and imputation work. We also run the census coverage survey which has been going for the last couple of uh, uh, censuses and is something that we do across the UK and across, across the, the globe indeed. And that also is a highly important statistical piece of work that helps us understand who's in the census but in the CCS, who's in the CCS and not in the census and who we've missed um, just generally. And again, we put that all together so that what we do is we build the quality of our outputs and that is going to be it will be assured by the office of statistical regulation and where that's what we will deliver so very very focused at this moment in time on maximizing returns to scotland census making good progress but it's that's not the only part of the solution we do many other things and one of the really fantastic developments over the last few years is the opportunity and ability to use administrative data in all sorts of ways to help us understand how we add value and quality to what is the, the base data, which is the, the information we bring through the census. Hope that's helpful. Yeah, thanks, Pete. That's really useful. I, I know that just from speaking to people, when I saw the coverage of the areas where there were slightly less returns, just uh, nudging a few people, have you done your return yet that, that I knew? And uh, then, oh, well, I've got, a, the deadline's not here yet. And I was like, no, it is, come on, get on with it. <laughs> um, so yeah, you've got a few more as a result of a, a bit of peer pressure from me. But I think if anyone on the call does know anyone that you think might not have, have returned, then please do, because the data is really, really important for planning all sorts of services. Um, so, and and not least that I, I want to talk about it in future. So um, <laughs> that would be really useful. Um, we're we're rapidly coming to the end of the the session i've i've still got questions unanswered in the the box so i'll quickly read through those but if either of you have spotted them while i'm reading uh please do um jump in um i think i'm a bit behind because there's a second question on health inequalities and how this will affect the population projections but i think we've covered that unless there's anything else to add uh, so we've done that one um, and uh, I think I think we're working our way through them. There's a, there's a few in the chat as well, so I'll also read those. This is the the trouble with to only do everything online at the same time. Um, so just I know Jennifer's already spoken. I'll ask her question. And um, Mike, you mentioned housing and the connection with birth rates and that ability and and almost having that um, 
a route in life to sort of feeling a bit more secure. And that, that's one of the generational things we're noticing now. Um, and the connection um, Jennifer's made in one of her questions is about the rise of second homes and Airbnbs in Scotland. And is that a contributing factor to um, preventing people getting on the housing ladder? I, I think that's an undoubted yes, because it drives up house prices. So I mean, we, we looked at some of the data um, for our recent uh, a consultation response on Airbnbs, and you know, there's there's individual Airbnb owners in Scotland that own over a hundred, a hundred properties. You know, that is undoubtedly going to skew, skew the housing market, and we can't ignore it. Um, I I won't ask either of you two to. Oh, I can see Mike's going to add. That's amazing. I, I, was, I was just going to add actually um, that you have to be a little bit careful from overgeneralizing about this. Mm -hmm. Um, one of the interesting things that has emerged in the last few weeks is Butte. And Butte um, is actually an area where population had been declining for some time. But the latest predictions are that Butte is actually starting to become rather, uh, rather um, more popular, uh, as potentially as a commuting uh, place for Glasgow. And indeed, it's not altogether clear um, that the Butte is not about to be on the way up. But one of the things that came out of the work that had been done is that, of course, the other thing that's very important for somewhere like Butte is that there are lots of places for tourists to go and stay. And if tourists don't stay, then there is a real problem in actually maintaining the underlying economy. And so you do have to be a little bit careful talking exactly where you're talking. I mean, Edinburgh is almost certainly over airbnb mm. but it may very well be some places where that competition is now becoming uh, a, 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 quite in, a quite interesting uh, quite interesting issue. And we shouldn't just blanket out um, Airbnbs um, or indeed second homes. It depends what happens to them and how much they bring into the economy, because actually sometimes they actually stimulate a lot of them of activity yep. and how often they're used yeah you're, you're right mike it's a really complex relationship and when you look at the data of where they're concentrated so edinburgh is one of them sky is another and uh, the east nuke of fife so i think it was ely from memory where um only 30 percent of the homes were occupied by people there throughout the week um and and that's you know proving really difficult for the for the area to maintain things like shops or a post office or you know the services that locals need so um yeah there's a, a real um complex relationship equally in edinburgh we've got people saying well airbnb guests spend more than than the locals do in my shop so therefore i want them so it's yeah the the relationship between them is 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 really tricky for the economy not tri no tricky in, in the tension house. yeah and uh, so I think we've done our questions. I'm pretty much there. There was another, but it seems to have disappeared. So I'm not sure if someone's deleted it. Uh, so I will say I I have had an amazing brain expansion time, as always. I think the the thing that I love when you two present is just how much I learn about what's behind the numbers. And, and that I think is is just incredibly useful for anyone working in policy because as soon as you know that you can begin to understand the difficulty in making these projections but also how much they change over time so that graph you had esther where you had the 2016 2018 2020 i have no doubt the next time we do this we'll probably be looking at a different line on that graph and and understanding you know where we where we've been and where we're going is really important for that degree of variation for any policy makers in, in the room. So I will give you both a chance for a last sentence or, or two before we finish up. Um, shall I come to you at first, Esther? Yeah, um, I just say everything that we've talked about, we publish on the NOS website. So it's all freely available to anyone. And if there's anything that you can't find that you want, um, you can get in touch. There's our contact details on our website as well. And we'll try to help you find it or say if we don't have it. And even where we talk about second homes now, we've got like interactive maps, like I showed you before, but where the second homes and empty properties and where student properties are and things like that in Scotland too. Um, and then the other thing is please go and fill in your sentence form if you haven't already done so and encourage other people to do the same 
Thanks, got... SJ. Final thoughts from Mike. Okay, uh, to just two really. I mean, one, um, uh, I would absolutely endorse what Esther says now about the NRS website. It is, it has got an amazing variety of data at um, all sorts of different geographies, as they call it, i.e. different uh, groupings. Um, and it, it is presented now in a much clearer and more accessible way, and they should be thanked greatly for that. I use this a great deal. Just another point, however, uh, really picking up what you said just a few minutes ago, Susan, um, it's worth remembering that in the 1930s, they're the first sets of projections suggested that Scotland might by now have a population of about one and a half million. So um, don't absolutely believe everything even though we have got a lot, lot cleverer now at actually making the projections. Thanks, Mike. I, I love your context. It's always fantastic. Um, so um, on, on that note, I will say thanks very much to you both and to the audience. I'm delighted to be bringing the event in on time again, which I, I hope the audience uh, appreciate. We, we always try not to, to take into your lunchtime too much. So um, I, it's been a phenomenal journey of learning again. And I hope that when the next projections come out, Esther and Mike, that you'll be able to join us again and give us a chance to, to look behind the scenes at those as well, um, because it is just so, so important to us all. Um, so thanks very much, everyone. We will make the recording available afterwards if you want to look at the slides or hear any of the discussion again. Um, and please do join us for our next event, which will be announced soon on the David Hume Institute website. And if you're not on our mailing list and you want to hear about that first, please do join the mailing list. So um, thanks very much, everybody. Um, it's been a pleasure as always to see you all. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye.